Hi, welcome to Release Your Wings. I'm Keith Woods of the Pointer Institute, and I'm here with Shireen Chada, of the director of the Tampa Brahma Kumaris. Today we're talking about accommodation, the power to merge, the power to adapt. Uh, Shireen, we've talked about a number of, of powers that essentially require you to uh, adapt, to absorb, to in some way or the other accommodate even uh, as a word. This one very specifically talks about how you handle uh, the input, the, the many things that come at you over the course of a day or a lifetime. Talk a little bit about how the power to accommodate is different, how it's distinct from some of the others. I, um, when I was actually thinking about the power to accommodate, I was thinking that actually you can categorize the different powers into the power of love, and then we'll like the power of truth, the power to confront, the power to face, the power to stand up for your um, whatever you believe in. So that power. And so the power of love, actually, there is a lot of power in love. And so some of these powers, like the power to tolerate, the power to accommodate, is actually the power of love. And so the other power we spoke about is the power to tolerate. And in the power to tolerate, it is about giving, but there could be certain remnants of negativity towards someone. There could be certain remnants of resistance and irritation to people. Even as you tolerate. Even as you tolerate. And the power to accommodate actually diminishes or gets rid of all of those things. So it is, in, in this case, uh, I think you used the word dissolving, mm -hmm. whatever those negative feelings might be, as you accommodate them. Right. And, 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 and it, does it assume in this, in this case that the things that you accommodate are necessarily then negative, bad, in no. need of accommodating? No. Um, actually, when you think about the power to accommodate, there are three grades of the power to accommodate. And the three grades are, just like in tolerate, I don't know if you remember that there were three grades of tolerance. In the same way, in accommodate also there are three grades. And so the first grade is that you go with the flow. With situations, with people, whatever is happening, you just learn to go with the flow. And then there's a second grade of it, that is you adjust your perception of things, that you don't look at things or people with the perception of the past, that you adjust it and you are able to adjust it and bring newness into your perception so that you actually you give them a chance to live a different way, that you're not holding on to the past of something. And this is more where forgiving and forgetting comes. So forgiving and forgetting actually are part of the power to accommodate. And then there is the third one, and the third one is um, actually much harder and it's a, it's a grade that I haven't actually completely mastered myself, but it's there, and that is that I am able to transform something of loss, something where people have defamed me, something where people mistakes that I accommodate in myself to such an extent that I'm able to transform it into a benefit. What would be the benefit? How can you take something, let's say that someone has said something bad about you, uh, or whatever the other remnants of the past might be. And one thing, it's one thing to say, I will forgive, I will forget, but now to take it and turn it into something positive, how, how do I see a benefit? Um, there is actually a benefit. People always feel that the quality that you need in this case, especially in the third case, is the quality of humility, very much. And then there is a benefit because people think that if I accommodate, right, someone said negative things to me, someone said did something really bad to me, and I still am able to look at their highest 
um, have the vision of their highest self, make sure that I am looking at them with love. And I'm, and in this case, actually, in the third case, is that I'm making their mistake my mistake. I'm looking, I'm having a vision that their mistake is my mistake. So just like I wouldn't spread my mistakes, I wouldn't spread their mistake. That's one thing. And the other thing is that I protect the other person's dignity as my own dignity. And so that is the third grade of this thing. And that there is benefit in that is that I don't get influenced by the other person in that state. And, I, and I not only that I don't get influenced in the other person, but my own greatness emerges. And that greatness, that quality, that my love for that other person actually has the power to affect long-lasting transformation in the other person. Well, it has the power. It doesn't necessarily have the guarantee, even the promise, that that will happen if you, if you accommodate, if you offer them uh, the forgiveness and the protection that you've talked about. You really haven't guaranteed any, anything is going to happen to their benefit, ultimately. Um, it's not a necessarily, yes, there is no guarantee that the other person will change. And I don't think we should go around sitting for other people to change because we could be waiting for a long time. Or um, that shouldn't be our focus because I feel that there's a paradox of change. That the more I want someone to change, the more resistant they will be to me. And so if I accommodate, if I, if I protect their dignity as my dignity, I make their mistake my mistake. And I have that love for them like I would look at them the way I would look at myself. If I have that love for them, then that itself at some point transforms. But even if it doesn't transform them, then it brings me happiness because there is a lot of elimination of waste thoughts that happen. It's a lot of um, junk that I hold. That, so it's actually beneficial for me because I start becoming the ocean. And as the ocean, I can hold a lot of things. In this case, as the ocean, I can hold a lot of wisdom. I can hold a lot of power. I can hold a lot of love. I can hold a lot of peace in that ocean that is myself. And ultimately, I can really be happy. But is, is, is it correct to hear this uh, as I am in that third phase, uh, as there but for the grace of God go I? <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's funny I should use God because I was thinking that the first two, where the first one is you go with the flow, you adjust to whatever situations, whatever people, whatever people's personalities are in any case, in any situation. And in the second case is where you're forgiving and forgetting. Both you can actually do without a connection with the higher power, with with a, without divine intervention, but the third one, you really need a connection with the higher power. Why? Because I feel that the higher power or God in this, that we refer to as God or the Supreme Soul, for us is the ocean of everything that is goodness, everything that is beautiful, every all the qualities like wisdom and love and power and all of that, that he actually he is the ocean of these qualities. And the only time I can become this mini ocean to accommodate all of this is when I'm in connection with that ocean. Well, it, you, you may have just answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway. When we talk about the ocean as the repository of everything, and uh, and and as you've discussed the, the metaphor, uh, the ocean can accommodate everything. It can accommodate the silt. It can accommodate the runoff. It can accommodate the, 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 pollu the pollutants that are, that are dis dispensed into it through the rivers and tributaries. And in the, in the secular world, ultimately, the ocean is polluted. Right. And, um, and we've seen... In, in our lifetime now, the possibility that something is vast and endless as the ocean can be damaged by the accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, so if we went with that metaphor all the way to the end, uh, am I not 
polluted by what I'm accommodating, ultimately. But I'm don't accommodating I someone's sure. mistake, you mean? Or, or, their, you know, or their hostility or their uh, benevolence, whatever the case might be. Right. In any power, there are two ways, actually. That question is a very nice question, and I was, I've been thinking about it a lot since you mentioned it last time. Is um, there are two ways about why me as the ocean is not similar to a physical ocean. One is that I'm a spiritual being um, having a human experience. As some French uh, saint said this at some point, but I always like that, that I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. And because I'm a spiritual being, I can recycle myself. I can regenerate myself. I, I operate under different conditions than a physical ocean. So the physical ocean also will be able to regenerate itself and recycle itself, but you have to give it time over many thousands of years maybe. But me, because I have consciousness, I have awareness, I can regenerate myself. That's one thing. And the other thing is that I feel that the illusion that we have about if hostility, if I accommodate hostility, that I will become hostile myself. Well, not necessarily that you become hostile, uh -huh. but that it will have a, uh, a negative effect on you. That right, it that you're going to hold on something. But I feel that when I accommodate, it's actually the other way around. When I accommodate, I'm adjusting in a way that I am not holding on to that negativity. If I don't accommodate, if I don't adjust, then I hold on. Well, what's the difference if, uh, if and, and I'll go through the three phases that you've described. Uh, in, if I go with the flow, if, for example, and, uh, and I'm dealing with uh, either an individual or a, a moment in time in which there's a great deal of negativity coming at me. Go with the flow means that I don't try to fight that, uh, that, I, that I simply uh, move along. Uh, if, if I move to the next phase, then I can make a conscious decision uh, easily to say, okay, that wasn't good, but I'm just going to forgive it and forget it. And however I manage to do the absolute in forgiveness, I've let go of something. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this last notion that uh, if I don't do the, the, the final accommodation, that I've somehow absorbed it, seems to be contradicted by the first two. I've, I've let go. I, let, I forgave. What more is there to do in accommodation than forgive? Um, this final grade is not necessarily that you lose out if you don't take the final step. That the first two steps are enough for a happy life. Because for forgiveness, you're not letting uh, the, your perception, you're renewing your perception every time, and whatever people you're forgiving, you're forgetting, and all of those things. And so you're really happy. But to really experience that deep spiritual joy and connection with the divine, I think the third level is important. Well, let me, I don't want to skip over what I think is a pretty um, monumental step in the second step. I, I sometimes hear you and think that you're making that, you know, uh, that jump that says, well, you know, here's how to be a millionaire. Well, you get a million dollars and then, uh, well, you say in, 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 that, that you, um, to get to forgiveness, uh, to, to get to forgetting and forgiveness, you've essentially uh, uh, allow the, the, the uh, offense to pass through you and move on. And I think that that's a pretty big it's, step. It's very right big. Um, actually, the power to accommodate, I have to have a, my confession, is one of my toughest powers. I'm not saying I'm in the third grade. Okay. Um, and I'm not saying it's easy to forgive and forget. But what makes it easy at this point for me is to know that if I hold on, I'm holding on to trash. You're holding on? To trash. And that, that trash is going to bother me more than the other person. But, it, but in renewing, even renewing my sense, my impression, my opinion, uh, it, 
it takes a, a pretty big leap. Uh, we talk about forgetting. Well, forgetting uh, is much harder than forgiving because it really does mean that you've made an adjustment in the way that you see something. And that to me seems to take an awful lot of just energy, just effort. Effort to forget. Um, yes, it does. It does take a lot, awful lot of energy to I mean, forget. You can't, you can't just erase it. You can't no, go into your head yeah. and say, "I no, no longer think of you that way." But there are a few meditation practices that you can do that make you forget. That for us, ours is a positive reinforcement meditation, where instead of trying to forget something, we try to remember something. And so we go through a whole thing which might not be appropriate right now, what we remember and the steps we go through and the, the different levels we do of remembering just generative eternal truths about the self, about the Supreme Soul, about time, about everything, so that we are actually able to forget. And it gets much easier to forget when you try to remember something more generative. So you, you're replacing one thought for another. Yes, you're replacing one. You're transforming one thought. You're changing one thought to the other. Otherwise, to actually just forget is very, very hard. I, I, someone, someone used uh, the phrase in talking about trauma that the body keeps score and the body doesn't forget. And, and that one of the reasons that you have to deal with trauma and deal with it head on is that regardless of how much you've chosen to not focus on it, the body remembers. And I wonder again about how we go from what is essentially a psychological uh, forgetting to something that's more, if not just physical, more complete and yeah. absolute. Yeah. Here, actually, when I'm talking about forgetting, we do make a distinction between the body and the spirit, the soul. And so the soul actually forgets. So let's say if I have a cut here, that there is a scar. But spiritually, because we are spiritual beings, we can recycle ourselves, like I was talking about. So we can, in a way, forget, but the only way we can do that is we have to replace it with something more generative. I mean, it's just... Um, a kinder, gentler brainwashing? <laughs> it's, you know, brainwashing has a very negative connotation. Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't have to be because it always happens. You know, your perceptions change. You're always getting influenced by things everywhere. And in this particular case, I feel your humility, your, um, your own goodness is taking over. So it's not necessarily brainwashing, but your own goodness is taking over. And I, I, I have something to share here. I was, look, I was thinking of all of the great leaders in history. Um, for example, Hitler. I know you might not agree he's a great leader, but he was. He affected a lot of people and made a lot of changes in the world. He, I felt, had power. He had knowledge, he had power, he had all of that, but he didn't have love and see how he misused it. And in the same way, and I really feel he lacked the power to adjust, the third grade of adjusting, where you treat the other person's dignity as your own dignity, because it is better not only for yourself, but it is better for the whole planet, for all of humanity for you to do that. And, and on the other hand, you see Christ, he had power, he had truth, he was able to face a lot of obstacles and challenges in his life, but he also had love, and that love became a power. Now this is uh, love as expressed in, uh, I would say in a biblical sense, but in, in, in a spiritual sense beyond the physical love that a lot of people immediately associate with the word, the infatuation kind of love that people associate with the word and something closer to what is, I guess, called agape love. Right, right. right. So it's the selfless kind. The selfless love. kind.